Hello, DEF CON. Uh, we're very excited to have you here. Uh, today we're going to talk about a very long research we've conducted in the past few years, exploiting OPC UA in every possible way. So let's start. My name is Sharon Brizino. I'm on vulnerability research at Clarity Team 2 I also have a DEF CON black badge. Woo! Uh, with me is Noah Moshe, uh, is also our senior researcher, and uh, we would like to say thank you very much for the other researchers who worked on this project, Uri Katz and Vera Mans. So thank you very much. Today we're going to talk about a very long research we've conducted on OPC UA security. So basically we researched a lot of, uh, actually dozens of OPC UA protocol stacks and different products and we found some core issues in their implementations. So it's not like we found a one off vulnerability in one product, rather we found and we were able to develop multiple attack vectors that exploited multiple products that support OPC UA. So all in all we found around 50 CVs and uh, we developed 12 unique generic attacks that we gathered into one huge framework and uh, we're going to release it open source. Uh, we also released uh, a fazer, o OPC UA fazer, uh, that uh, actually many vendors are currently using as part of the secure, secure development and they also found a couple of bugs with it so uh, I think it was very helpful. Um, and finally big thanks to ZDI. Um, some of this research at least uh, was very incentivized because of pwn to own so ZDI has their pwn to own competitions uh, and also they have the specific ICS category which they emphasized on OPC UA. So it gave us uh, the cash prize obviously, uh, gave us uh, a good incentive to research OPC UA, find bugs and get 200k. So today we're going to talk about uh, what is OPC UA, uh, cover some protocol stack implementations, go over bits and bytes, well, which is a bit boring. <laughs> uh, we're going to, to cover the research methodology, so how we approach this project, how we research different protocol stacks, uh, etc. Uh, and afterwards we're going to show you uh, some cool vulnerabilities and exploits uh, we're able to find and finally release our OPC UA exploit uh, framework. So let's start with what is the problem? So why OPC UA was created from the fir first place? So in the past, uh, let's say we had a physical process. In this case, uh, water tank uh, that we want to keep track of the water level. So we have a PLC uh, with some kind of a logic that keeps track uh, using sensors on the water level. And these are configured as variables. So the sensor is reading where the water level uh, is and we have a variable that is changing in the process. Now if we want to monitor this uh, procedure, uh, for example from an HMI or a SCADA server, uh, we had to use the specific proprietary ICS protocol um, in order to communicate with the PLC to read and write uh, these tags values or variables. Um, and obviously it's not very convenient because if you want different products to communicate with it, uh, we're very limited. So OPC UA was introduced uh, in order to have kind of a unified way to communicate between different devices and products in within a SCADA network. So now we could all communicate OPC UA and we do not, do not have to be uh, limited by the specific ICS protocol. Uh, and this is why many vendors joined in and today most of the vendors are supporting OPC UA uh, in various ways uh, from servers to clients to support in PLCs, SCADA servers. So it became uh, kind of a, the new standard uh, and it's very popular today. Um, and if in essence the, the protocol was created for kind of a unified way for data exchange between industrial devices. So we have the server which stores the variables, for example the water level variable and we have clients that read or write to these variables to uh, monitor the process or also alter and modify the process. Now it's very used, uh, it's very widely used uh, by almost any vendor. So let's go over a bit of the history of OPC UA. Now, OPC UA was created by OPC Foundation uh, and the first specs goes back to 2006 and it was created based on lesson learned from the OPC classic, OPC DA. So in the past there was a different protocol with a similar purpose 
uh, but it wasn't good enough. Uh, it lacked uh, independent platform independent, so it was very tied to Windows, um, and it was not scalable. It was not secure. So OPC Foundation created OPC UA and also created a very thorough and uh, deep specifications to make sure everybody are using it correctly and also to cover all the topics that anyone needs to know about OPC UA. So for example, uh, how uh, objects are created in OPC UA is found in a specification. How security works is also found in a specification. So if everyone, anyone wants to implement OPC UA, uh, obviously they need to read the specification and they're pretty good so it's uh, very kind of uh, uh, easy to read and follow. Now, to accelerate the use of OPC UA, OPC Foundation created uh, three main protocol stacks. They created the Java protocol stack, .NET protocol stack, and NCC protocol stack. Basically what they tried to do is they tried to create some kind of SDKs or core libraries that other products could easily implement in their software to add support to OPC UA. So, in essence, to expedite popularity, OPC Foundation created the first OPC UA protocol stacks. And today there are hundreds, uh, maybe thousands of products using OPC UA from servers to clients to protocol gateways and they can all be found in the OPC UA uh, OPC Foundation website. And when we started this research we also went over this website and we looked at the different products and it's very convenient uh, to see what products are supporting OPC UA. Now, the problem is that most products are actually heavily relying on the base protocol stacks that OPC Foundation created. So if we look at uh, some of the top pro products today that implement OPC UA, we can see that most of them are using OPC Foundation core libraries. So, for example, the OPC Foundation uh, .NET is actually the, the actual first OPC UA .NET uh, protocol stack. So the, the vendors created products that use the, the core libraries and added a little bit uh, of their own touch or their own code to modify it, but in essence, they're still using the same protocol stack as the core library. So we wanted to find vulnerabilities in the base protocol stacks so we will not exploit or find vulnerabilities in just one product, rather we will exploit all of them or at least a big portion of them. And to do this we created a very long list of different OPC UA protocol stacks and products and we tried to divide them into different categories. So we picked different protocol stacks written in uh, from C to C++, Python, Java, um, basically any modern uh, programming language and we divided all of these products to different categories which and each category is based on a very similar protocol stack. In this, uh, in this way if we found a bug or a vulnerability in one of the core libraries of a specific category we could exploit all of the uh, products that use the same core. So before we dive in into the vulnerabilities themselves, uh, let's go over quickly how OPC UA is implemented. So in OPC UA we have this concept that is called nodes. Uh, so in OPC UA everything is a node. Uh, for example, our water level variable is uh, a node of type variable and it has its own uh, subtype uh, float. So basically it's a variable that has uh, a value of type float. Um, and in OPC UA also we have the concept of namespaces. So namespaces are kind of containers for nodes and we can have different namespaces uh, for different purposes. So for example we can have a namespace with all the base nodes and we can create our own namespace that ex extends uh, different objects for our purposes. Um, in names in namespaces we have the nodes so therefore nodes are identified by namespace ID and also node ID. So if we want to refer to a specific node in the entire address space we will need to specify the namespace and the identifier. Now since 
the specifications are very, very thorough and uh, detailed. Uh, they also tell us how to encode these nodes. So, for example, in the specification, they tell us that uh, we can encode uh, namespace with a single byte and identifier with two bytes. And we actually looked at the specification in order to understand how to implement it ourselves. So, it was very uh, beneficial for us to read the specification and understand this. In OPC UA, we also have this concept of services. So, uh, services is our interaction with the server and by activating some kind of a services. And we can activate different services on different nodes. So, for example, if we want to read a variable or a tag, we can use the read service to read its value. If we want to write to it, we will use the OPC UA write service. So services are very, uh, is our way to interact with the server and actually to implement OPC UI you need to implement a lot of these services. So if we sum up uh, this uh, crash course, uh, so we have uh, for in our example, for example, um, tank, water tank in our water tank, we want to monitor this process. Um, so the water level in our OPC UI model will be a variable of type float and if we will want to read it, we will use the read service from our HMI and our HMI will continuously read this variable using OPC UA the read service. Sorry for the boring stuff, let's go uh, to some more exciting stuff. Uh, so we have uh, uh, our research, we researched OPC UA for a very long time and uh, when we came up to start this research, we needed to come up with a plan. So we started with buying two Intel nukes, uh, which are very powerful computers, somewhat powerful, uh, and we installed uh, VMware E6i on those uh, nukes. Uh, we did this because we wanted to install many, many products from uh, different categories. So, for example, to install OPC UA servers, OPC UA clients, OPC UA uh, protocol gateways. Uh, and also different protocol stacks and SDKs. So we needed a lot of different virtual machines in order to install all of these products so we could research their binaries or review the code. And to do this, we started to build our own client. So we wanted a way to interact with these products and we wanted a way for us to uh, kind of poke these servers to reach some uh, code path and we decided from very early on the research to build our own uh, protocol stack. So we wanted to build our client that we could easily modify or change and play with the different packets. We also wanted hands on experience with OPC UA. So we wanted to understand better how objects are created. We wanted to understand better how uh, services are being used and so we, use, we created our own client to make sure we under really understand how OPC UA is being used. After building our client, uh, the next step for us was to have some kind of uh, fuzzers running passively in the background. Uh, so we wanted uh, something to fuzz all of the products that we installed and we had dozens of products installed in our, in our uh, environment and we created our network fuzzer. Uh, so the network fuzzer uh, was based on Bufaz framework. Uh, it's uh, very convenient to easily write uh, network fuzzers based on this framework. Uh, and we implemented six different services, uh, including read, browse, write, etc. Uh, and we fuzzed them all on all the product. So we had dozens uh, or even more than dozens of uh, uh, protocol fuzzers trying to exploit or at least find crushes. Uh, in all the products that we installed. And it was actually very beneficial because it helped us to, to find a couple of bugs and we also released it as open source so now vendors are using this as part of the, their uh, security development cycle. We also created coverage based fuzzers. So at one point we found uh, ANSI C OPC UA stack. So it was uh, source code of uh, the, implementa the C implementation of uh, a protocol stack. And we took it, we created some harnesses with libfuzzer and AFL. Uh, and we also ran this for a couple of weeks. Uh, unfortunately, it did not find any bugs, uh, mostly because Kaspersky did the same thing a few, a few years ago. 
but it was still very helpful for us uh, because we created a lot of corpuses, so we created a way uh, to reach a certain code path within these products. Finally, we needed a way to control all the fuzzers, all the running fuzzers. So we built um, a Slack bot that monitors all the different fuzzers and whenever we reach the crash, we receive the notification and also a screenshot. So it was very helpful for us uh, to monitor these hundreds of fuzzers running in our infrastructure. And it's also, it also helped us to understand what's going on and keep uh, uh, on monitoring and getting the status every every single time. Next, while we have all of our fuzzers running in the background, uh, we wanted to move on and uh, do some manual research. So we turned out to the specification and started to understand and look for esoteric and complex features and mechanisms. So basically we asked ourselves, what will developers overlook when implementing the specification? And just to give you an idea uh, what it means, uh, let's go over uh, this example. So uh, when we read the message header specification, so in OPC UA we have a very strict way to send OPC UA messages and part of these messages we have the header. And inside the header we have a flag saying whether the message we're sending is complete or whether is it chunked. So we can send a very, very, very big uh, long message and we can send and we can divide it into different chunks and send each chunk every time. So in the header we have a way of saying, uh, of notifying the server whether this specific packet is a chunk or it's the final message and now it needs to process, process all the different chunks we sent. So we asked ourselves what happens if we're sending the server a chunk and another chunk and another chunk without ever sending the final chunk. What will happen? The server will uh, terminate the session, the server will crash. So these, type, these types of features uh, we tried to research and explore. So let's move on uh, to the cool stuff, um, the vulnerabilities and exploits. And we will start with the denial of service scenarios. Obviously denial of service is a big deal when we're talking about ICS or SCADA because um, sh shutting down a server might, uh, might mean shutting down an entire factory. Um, so obviously we wanted to research and explore denial of service scenarios. For example, what happens if we're able to crush the OPC UA server. And to do this we did not just want to think about okay a single crash or something that uh, our father found. We actually approached it uh, from a very um, thorough way I would say because we created ourselves categories for example uncontrolled memory management and we followed these categories to find specific attacks against these categories. So we actually when we reversed reverse engineer the code or when we did the code uh, review, we tried to think uh, what will cause uncontrolled memory management or what will cause a thread deadlock and we follow different code paths that we believed will get us to this point. So if we take uh, example uh, the chunk floating as I started to describe earlier, then as I mentioned we have in the OPC UA header we have the chunk type, this is the flag I was referring to and it has two main values, C or F. C means this specific packet is a chunk and it's part of a longer chain of chunks and F means this is the final chunk and now you need to process all the previous chunks. If we look at different servers, uh, for example this is the OPC UA.NET stack, we will see a if statement uh, checking for is final, meaning is the flag F and if so, stop processing uh, the message, stop to receive more chunks and start to process the entire message. So what we did was simple. We sent a lot of chunks and we just never sent the final chunk and finally the server crashed. So we used this vulnerability not once, so it was not an off one vulnerability. We actually used this vulnerability against 
different protocol stocks because apparently many developers did not think what will happen if they will receive a lot of different chunks. And we were able to exploit uh, and actually crush a lot of different OPC UA servers. Another example uh, from our use after free category is method calling from a dead session. Now, it turns out that in OPC UA, we have a way to activate methods remotely. So we can configure in, in the OPC UA server a method. For example, here uh, we have a method uh, to multiply two nodes, and these nodes are obviously from type uh, integer or float. And we have a way to activate these messages remotely by sending a method activation or invoke. Now we looked at the specification and we noticed something very interesting. It actually says in the specification, what if the, if the method calling uh, is created from a session and we actually send a lot of different methods and then terminate the session, the specification say that the server should not return answer to the client because the session is terminated. Obviously we thought ourselves, okay, uh, what happens if the developers did not uh, implement this correctly? So what will happen if we will send a very long list of methods, for example, 255 methods in an array for the, the OPC UA server to start processing and we terminate our session in between. So how it looks like? We're preparing a lot of methods to send to the server. We're sending all of these methods to the server. The server starts analyzing all the methods and in between we're terminating our session. Now the server continues to process all the methods and finally it needs to send back the result to the client. However the session is gone and if developers are not implementing this correctly they will try to dereference non-existing session which will result with an access violation. So again this was this scenario was based on something we read in the specification and we thought ourselves will be interesting to implement. And by the way, all these attack vectors are implemented in our uh, framework, exploit framework, uh, which you can access uh, through GitHub and we'll show you later how to access it. Okay, so denial of service is okay. Uh, I mean, we can cross servers in, in uh, scan networks, but that's not uh, a big deal enough. We wanted to have a way to do remote code execution. We wanted a way to control the OPC UA server and maybe modify these tags. So, for example, not just uh, crashing the OPC UA server, but actually change the water level from 0 to 100 and change how factories and change how the physical process looks like. This is much more interesting. So, uh, we decided to research uh, the PTC Kepler. Um, this is a very popular software. Uh, it's one of the industry leading uh, OPC UA servers used in the biggest manufacturing lines including oil rigs, wind farms, uh, etc. Uh, it's Windows based, uh, 32 bits, implemented as a server, as a service, and we re researched this uh, product for uh, quite some time. By the way, uh, we, al we also let our fuzzer to fuzz this uh, process uh, and this uh, product for quite some time. And uh, one day uh, at night, uh, we received a notification from our Slack bot uh, that there is a crash. Uh, and at the beginning, we were very specti spectacled that uh, it's not a real crash, um, but our researchers, uh, Uri and Vera, started to look at it and they discovered it has uh, something to do with uh, string manipulation. So they tried to get even deeper into this what happened exactly in the process of converting strings and they discovered something very interesting that we'll cover now. In OPC UA, uh, we need to encode our strings in some way and transfer it over the network line. So uh, if we, for example, have a, a tank ID in our example, we have a tank ID uh, or a tank location name, uh, then we need to encode the string, as you can see here, in some way uh, and send it over the line to the OPC UA server. Now, in OPC UA, all the strings are UTF-8 encoded. 
But some of the servers are using UTF-16. For example, Capware is using UTF-16 uh, as a way to encode the strings. So whenever Capware read the strings from the packet, it actually tried it to convert from UTF-8 to UTF-16, and there we noticed the crash. So there was something in the conversion between UTF-8 to UTF-16. So before I explain what happened, let's go over what is UTF-8 and UTF-16 encoding. UTF-8 uh, is a type of encoding that we can uh, represent symbols, for example, uh, the letter A with some bits. Uh, for example, A is uh, 41 hexa. But if we have other symbols that are bigger than uh, 7F hex, we need, uh, a d uh, we need another byte to represent this symbol. So for example, uh, this funny looking A is represented as C380. So some bytes or uh, sorry, some symbols are represented as a single byte and some symbols are represented as two bytes or three bytes or even four bytes. And Kepware, whenever it received a message, OPCUA message with a string, it tried to understand how many symbols are within this string. Why? Because it needed to understand how to al allocate memory for the UTF-8, UTF-16 conversion. So for example, if we're sending uh, this string, Kepware will try to understand how many symbols are inside. So it knows that 41 means one symbol and C3 probably means two symbols because this is above 7F. And so it tries to calculate how many symbols we have. For example, here we have one symbol represent, represented with one byte, another symbol represented with one byte, another one with another byte, and we have a symbol, this funny looking A, with two bytes until it reaches a null terminator. And whenever it reaches a null terminator, it stops and calculating exactly how many symbols it has so it could convert it to UTF-16. But what happens if we're sending just the C3 at the end? Kepware will probably think it, it's a symbol, one symbol represented with two bytes and will jump two bytes. So let's see how it happens. So we have the 41, which is one symbol, one byte. 41, one symbol, one byte. Another one, and then we have C3. C3 in Kepler uh, logic means to jump two bytes. So it will jump above the null terminator, and we're starting to jump on the heap. And this means we will jump on the heap until we're reaching another null terminator, and we could leak data. So we actually used uh, this vulnerability in order to leak a lot of data from the heap, uh, but we also were able to leverage this further. So first of all, leaking data from the heap, uh, we used the read, read tag. So for example, if, uh, if we want to read variables of, or tags from the OPCUA server, we'll use the read service and we could just specify the node ID. Uh, so node ID and namespace ID. And we could read the tag, tag information. But if we're sending, uh, if the, the node is encoded with a C3 at the end, whenever Kepler will try to convert, we'll start to read the data from the heap. So we used it to leak a lot of data from the heap. And this way, we were able to leak pointers and defeat the SLR. We also did kind of the opposite. So we used the write service in order to write memory into the heap. And we used the write functionality. So for example, we wrote a tag that ends with C3. And whenever Kepler tried to convert it from UTF-8 to UTF-16, we started to write, overwrite the, the heap. So now we had uh, an out-of-bound read to leak pointers in the fit ASLR, and we also had out-of-bound write to construct our rope chain and eventually get remote code execution. So uh, our researcher, Uri, uh, were able to really convert it into a full chain, and first of all, he used uh, the leak uh, primitive to leak a lot of data from the heap. Then he overwrote, uh, he calculated some addresses uh, that are needed in order to create our rope chain, overrode some uh, information on the heap, 
and finally triggered the bug and got full remote code execution. <laughs> Great. So we covered the denial of service scenarios, also remote code execution scenarios in OPC A servers. Let's see how to do this with remote code execution in clients. Okay, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, like Sharon said, at this point we exploited many different products. It started with OPC UA uh, uh, servers, also some OPC UA gateway protocols, but that's when we thought to ourselves, Let's try and look at clients as well. Now, what is the usual suspect and like the immediate thing that you think about whenever you're talking about exploiting OPC UA clients? Well, it might look like this. We have an OPC UA client connecting to a rogue or malicious OPC UA server. And whenever it does it, it tries to read, write, or interact with different tags, and somehow, by returning malicious data, uh, the server uh, is able to exploit and run code and execute code on the OPC UA clients. Now, when we realized this is the attack scenario, we thought to ourselves, yeah, we looked at pretty much logical bugs and memory corruptions, and these are very, very tough, meaning they take a lot of time to research and fully exploit, and it's not that easy. I mean, just on the memory corruption Sharon showed you just now, to actually fully exploit it on Windows 10 machine, it takes months and months, uh, and many of our researchers like Uri worked on it for a very long time. However, we thought to ourselves, maybe there's an easier way to exploit OPC UA clients that are less relevant to OPC UA servers. And that's when we looked at two very, very popular OPC UA clients, being inductive automation ignition and softing data feed edge aggregators. Now, this is kind of the big names in OPC UA clients. These are uh, SCADA and data servers that also have the functionality to connect to an OPC UA server and read and write tags to it. However, one more thing they have in common is that they are both web-based, meaning they are used from a browser by a client and connect to the ignition automa in the active automation ignition server using web browser. And that's when we thought to ourselves, yeah, web browser are a little bit easier. What can we do in them? Well, of course, the main functionality in OPC UA clients is reading, writing, or subscribing to tags, meaning I want to read a variable, so I'll read or write to it. That's when we thought to ourselves, yeah, let's say this scenario will happen. We have our OPC UA client connecting to our malicious server and trying to read a tag, like in Sharon's example, trying to read the water level. Well, Whenever it tries to read a tag, our server simply says, yeah, sure, here you go, read a tag. However, instead of returning actual value, like a float number or a string, we return a simple XSS script tag, uh, which then the client stakes and inserts it into its DOM. Now, whenever it inserts into its DOM, it simply executes it, and we have the ability to execute code in the context of the client's browser. And as it turns out, both of these servers are actually have an XSS vulnerability in the reading and writing tag functionality, meaning we were able to, as you can see here, achieve alert in softing and of course in ignition as well. Now, XSS is pretty cool, but I guess all you can do with it is maybe recrawl the user. I mean, it's not remote code execution per se. That's when we thought to ourselves, how can we take it further and actually leverage our XSS vulnerability into achieving a full-on remote code execution on the ignition, the inductive automation ignition and softing edge aggregator servers? Well, as it turns out, we actually chained multiple vulnerabilities in both servers in order to achieve the remote code execution vulnerability. So let's take a look at both of these exploitation chains and see how easy it was in comparison to the full-on pledged uh, memory corruption vulnerability we showcased to you before. So in the case of Ignition, one of the main functionality the Cephal offers is the ability to import and uh, basically upload a new project. Now in this project, we can set up something called gateway events. What's gateway event, you might ask? Well, basically, it's a callback script that we can uh, add that will be executed whenever a certain thing happens. Like in this case, we're talking about a script being executed every few seconds on a scheduled event. Now, inductive automation ignition chose to allow users to add Python code to their gateway scripts, meaning by simply having our uh, 
uh, by simply uh, uploading our callback script, we are able to execute arbitrary Python code and achieve remote code execution on the Ignative Automation Ignition server. Now this was a whole chain starting from the XSS in the OPC UA client read. However, and however we also wanted to look at Softing and try and exploit a few functionality there. Well, in Softing we don't have a project upload, however we have something that could be similar, a procedure restore, meaning we want to restore our old configuration of the cell and go back in time and basically have the old settings. Well, whenever we do it, when uh, perform a procedure restore procedure, we actually upload a zip file to the cell and the cell basically unpacks it and loads an XML and configuration files from this zip. Well, we looked at uh, the softing server and found a few vulnerabilities involving zip slip and prat traversal, meaning we had the ability to basically write files anywhere on the system whenever we invoke the procedure restore. And by uploading a shared object uh, that will execute code whenever it is loaded, we are able to execute code on the server, allowing us to basically control it and having remote code execution on both servers. Now, these exploitations started from the OPC UA vector, meaning we had the ability to execute code in the context of the browser. However, by chaining it with a few different vulnerabilities, we are able to achieve full on remote code execution on the client, uh, allowing us basically to exploit it as well uh, and achieve fully you know, pledged remote code execution. Now, everything we showed you is pretty cool as pre and pretty expensive. Uh, however, during the uh, development of this entire process and research, we developed our own exploitation framework that we're going to share with you today. And like Sharon showed you, we researched dozens and dozens of different protocols and we actually discovered over 50 unique CVAs. I, see, I think we are getting closer to 60 at the moment. Uh, and developed a lot of the, what we call uh, attack concept, meaning one vulnerability, one kind of logic flaw that could affect multiple different servers and multiple different products. That's why we created our own OPC UI client and our own actually OPC UI exploitation framework that you can feel free to clone it and scan it and do it for your own. Uh, this framework is pretty extensive and contains the entire knowledge base that we researched in the last few years uh, and we hope it will be useful uh, and basically it is released as an open source project. Uh, so feel free to download it from our GitHub account. Uh, in this framework you'll find the full on uh, POC script uh, and uh, exploitation techniques of all the different attacking scenarios we developed like the chunk flooding that Sharon showed you, like uh, the capware vulnerability in the UTF-8 uh, uh, bed allocation and bed string concatenation and of course dozens and dozens of other vulnerabilities we uncovered over the last three years. Uh, so feel free to use it and feel free to share it and uh, use it in your own uh, servers, environments, etc. So let's summarize everything up and see the entire uh, process we've done. So like Sean told you, during the last three years we researched pwn to own heavily, uh, we researched OPC UA heavily, mainly as the pwn to own contest, however also on our own, looking at different products, different OPC UA implementation, protocol stacks, code bases, etc. We found and discovered over 50 vulnerabilities, exhausting uh, protocol stacks that affects dozens and dozens and actually probably thousands of different OT environments. And we work closely with the vendors to fix every vulnerability uh, and they disclose it to them and make sure that the environments are more safe and more secure. We actually gave them early access to our OPC UA exploitation framework uh, and we can uh, basically giving the OPC UA vendors and uh, developers the ability to test their products against the different attack techniques we developed and look for bugs in their own code base. And we are happy to say that a lot of them used it and actually found new vulnerabilities using our own OPC UA exploitation framework. So please do use it as well in your OT environments, in your products, etc. Use it, add to it, it is open source. Uh, so of course you can contribute to it as well. And thank you very much for our talk, to, for attending our talk on OPC UA. Thank you very much.